Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Mike Wilson, and whoever you are, and wherever you are, whether you're a regular with us or just visiting online, I would like to welcome you this morning to our service of worship here at Manor Park Church. It's pretty much three months now since we started these services, but the time just seems to have shot by, and we now have our own box set on YouTube to compete with the best of them. You should be familiar by now with how these services are going to go. First of all, we will sing together, which will be led today by Zoe. And then there'll be a children's talk from Yvonne, followed by a Bible reading from Lorna. And then it's back to me for prayer before I hand over to our pastor, Roy Summers, who will be speaking today in the next of our series on the Apostles' Creed. Today, we will be looking at what the Bible says about the future return of Jesus. Hopefully, we will keep the whole thing to about an hour in total. So let us start by reading some verses from Psalm 16, where we can follow David as he writes to praise and to thank God and to express his joy at knowing him. Psalm 16. Keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my God. Apart from you, I have no good thing. I say of the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones in whom all is my delight. Those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. I will not pour out libations of blood to such gods or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand I shall not be shaken. And therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices, and my body also will rest secure, because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you see your faithful one decay. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. So that was David's experience of knowing God so many thousands of years ago. And uh, our prayer, of course, is that that is also our own. So let us turn to prayer now before we then move to, uh, to worship in song. Let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, help us now to put aside all the cares and worries of the present time as we now focus on you and come to worship you this morning. Calm our hearts and minds Help us to put aside the distractions of work and home as we listen and respond to you. Thank you for all that you've done for us in this past week, for all your care, your provision and goodness to us. And thank you for Jesus. Thank you even for all we've learnt about Jesus in these services over the past month and for what we're going to learn today. You are our God. Apart from you, we have no good thing. And our hearts are glad and our tongues rejoice because you have made known to us the path of life. So be with us as we worship you now. May your Holy Spirit bless us as we enjoy our time together in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks, Mike. It's great to be able to sing together and worship our Saviour Jesus Christ during these challenging times. I was recently chatting to someone who was suffering the effects of COVID-19 and the thing that they said they'd missed the most was being able to sing praise to God. The virus had resulted in a dryness to their throat, had taken their breath and had made them weak. But yet their desire to sing praise to God was ever present. So may this be true of us today as we prepare our hearts for worship that our desire also would be to lift up our voices in praise to our maker. It says in Psalm 150 verse 6, Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. So let's do that now as we sing together. Yeah. 
Father, thank you that you are Lord over all things, that you made us and that you give us each breath we take. Help us to have a desire to worship you for all you have done and we give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, children. I'd like to start today's children's talk with a quiz. So I've got five questions I'm going to ask you. For each question, there's going to be a picture clue on the screen, so have a look at the picture. Then you say your answer, and then I'll put up the correct answer. Keep a record of your score, and if you get five out of five, maybe ask mom to send me a text and let me know how well you did. Okay, so here's number one. When we first met Saul, why was he traveling to Damascus? Okay, did you say this? He was going there to arrest and persecute Christians. Saul hated the followers of Jesus. Number two, in Philippi, we meet a lady called Lydia who became a follower of Jesus. What was her job? Look at the picture clue. Okay, she was a rich business lady who sold purple cloth. Number three. Last week, Ruth told you about what happened when Paul and Silas were arrested for preaching about Jesus. What did Paul and Silas do in prison at midnight? Have a look at the picture clue again. That's right, they were singing praises to God. How amazing. Number four, look closely at these three pictures. I want to know what amazing thing happened to each person before these pictures happened, before they were baptised. Yes, that's right. They all believed in Jesus and became Christians and then they were baptised. 
Finally, number five. Look at this picture. What are all the children doing? Okay, did you say they're following Jesus? That's right, they're following Jesus in the picture. Now, I've got another question for you just to end the quiz. How do we follow Jesus today? Now, that's what Paul spent his life doing, traveling around and telling people how to follow Jesus in his day. And we learn from the Bible how to follow Jesus today. Now, when we meet Paul in our story today, he's in Athens in Greece. And so far, almost everywhere he's gone, the Jews have caused trouble for him and chased him out of the towns. When Paul arrived in Athens, he was so disturbed to see that the city was full of statues of false gods. Here are some of your pictures of that scene. First of all, Paul went to the synagogue in Athens to talk to the Jews and to explain that Jesus is the Messiah and that they should worship Jesus. Next, he talked to people in the markets. A group of philosophers were there. They were men who liked to talk about the latest ideas. They asked Paul to come to the Areopagus to talk to their city leaders. So Paul went and he explained to them how the true and living God created the world and all human beings. Here's some of your pictures of that scene. Paul said to them, God doesn't want people to make idols out of gold or stone and then to worship those idols. Paul told them that God wanted all people to repent of their sins and to believe in Jesus, whom God raised from the dead. Paul talked about the resurrection. But when they heard this, when they heard about Jesus rising from the dead, some of them mocked Paul and they laughed at him. Others said, oh, well, we'd like to hear a little bit more about this resurrection idea. That's a new idea to us. And a few people believed the gospel message. They believed in Jesus and became followers of Jesus. So what does God want us to learn from this true Bible story of Paul's visit to Athens? Sadly, in Athens, most of the Jews and the Greeks did not believe Paul's message about Jesus. That's really sad, isn't it? But if we are Christians, then we do believe Paul's message and Jesus is very precious to us. So can I ask you children, is Jesus special to you? Do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe that he died for your sins? Do you believe that he rose again and one day you will meet him face to face in heaven? We're going to end today with the eagles saying a Bible verse from 1 Corinthians. Paul wrote his letter to the church in Corinth a few years after he'd made that visit to Athens, that sad visit to Athens. And I wonder whether he had that visit in mind when he wrote this verse. So have a listen to eagles and see what you think. Over to eagles. We preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks. Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. First Corinthians chapter 1, verses 23 and 24. Thank you, Yvonne. Today's reading is from Matthew chapter 24, verses 36 to 44. But about that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, 
People were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Up to the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known what at what time the night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have left his house broken into. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Well, thank you, Lorna. So there's just the one notice this week, which is that next week we will again have our mass Zoom coffee after church at 11.45, with everybody dialing in and then randomly assigned to small groups for chat. And if you don't get an invitation to this and you would like to take part, and we would love to have you with us, then please do contact us via the church website to make sure you get an invitation this week. So before I now pray, we have a few greetings to show you once again, and this time it's from the Thursday evening home group, which of course is the best one. Hello everybody. Hope you're all well. Look forward to seeing you again. Hi, Hi church, church family. Hi to everyone at Manor Park. I'm missing everyone very much and longing to be together again normally once this uh, COVID situation is over. Very much love and our Lord Jesus to everyone. Good morning, everyone. Hello, everyone. Hello Church family! We hope to see you all soon! Love, Love from, from the Holloways! Well, thank you everyone. That was the Thursday evening home group and perhaps I better take back what I said. But I'm now going to lead us in prayer before I hand over to Roy. So let's bow our heads now and pray. Dear Father, we thank you for your love and your care to us all in the current times of difficulty. First of all, as we pray, we would pray for those who are in special need of your love, strength and comfort at this time. We think of those we know who are struggling with difficult issues, health issues perhaps, or other difficult personal struggles with family or relationships, or with financial difficulties, we think of those who lost their jobs and for those who are grieving. And we bring them in our hearts before you now. Comfort them with your love. Give them your strength and your hope and the awareness of your presence alongside them always. We pray also for those we support who are in service to you overseas. We think of Sarah in South Africa. We ask you to bless her and her work at Morning Star Children's Centre. We pray for Tim and Tina, who are due to return shortly, all being well. And Fiona and Evaya in Peru, especially given the difficult situation there. And we continue to pray for our government at this time. Indeed, we pray for all governments that you would give them wisdom in how to best handle the current crisis now that uh, things are changing and, and getting more turbulent. For those who are making difficult decisions that affect us all, we pray that you would guide them in their judgments. And we continue to thank you and pray for our doctors, nurses and all people in many different areas working so hard to keep the rest of us safe and well at this time. Give them strength and courage, especially when they're finding it tough. And we pray for those who don't yet know you as their Lord and Saviour, especially those we know that somehow through us you might show yourself to them and bring them to salvation. And we commit our giving to you, however this is done. 
We thank you for giving us so much and we ask you to bless that which we give back to you. May it be used to further your kingdom and to give you glory. And finally, we pray for Roy as he now speaks and brings your word to us. Help us to understand this clearly. Help it to speak to our hearts and help us to understand especially those things that you would like us to. And we pray for all these things in the name of our dear Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you, Mike, and good morning to all my brothers and sisters at Manor Park Church and to all our friends and listeners wherever you are. I have some neckties in my wardrobe, um, which I don't wear these days because they are out of fashion. Just because they're unfashionable today doesn't mean they'll always remain out of fashion, of course, and that's how I persuade myself and my wife to keep them. As we are making our way through the Apostles' Creed on Sunday mornings, we've come to a line which does not come out of the preaching wardrobe very often, because it is out of fashion in the age in which we live. Here's the line. We're making our way slowly through. Here's the line for today. Jesus will come again to judge the living and the dead. Jesus will come again is out of fashion, and to judge the living and the dead is especially out of fashion today. But just because a truth is unpopular to the world out there, it is no reason for the church to throw it out or uh, cease preaching it, especially since the return of Jesus is mentioned 300 times in the New Testament, which is about once in every 13 verses. It's a great priority, and especially since this great future event, the return of Jesus, is spoken of in Scripture as our great hope. Uh, here, here, Paul in Titus 2, we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's go on a very simple three-step journey this morning through this line of the creed. First, let's outline what the truth uh, is behind this line. Then ex let's explore, spend a few moments uh, asking, why is this unpopular? Why is this truth kept in the wardrobe today? And then thirdly, let's apply our truth, this truth, to our hearts and to our lives today. It's both a comfort and, I must say, it's a great challenge to Christian living today. So let's start with uh, trying to understand what this line, what, what scripture and truth this line is trying to teach us today. Jesus will come again to judge the living and the dead. And I think there are three very simple truths that um, this line uh, brings out and highlights. First of all, Jesus is coming back to the world in great glory one day. This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven, this is what the angels said to the disciples as they were watching Jesus ascend, this same Jesus will come back in the same way that you have seen him go into heaven. Just as he went up into heaven, now he's, one day he's going to come back. But this time it will be in great power and splendor. The Son of Man, this is Matthew 25, will come in his glory and all of his angels with him. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. 1 Thessalonians 4. The Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. 2 Thessalonians 1. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. Revelation 1, 7. When is this going to happen? No one knows. Matthew 24, about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. When Jesus Christ came into the world the first time, it was as a helpless and an unknown weak infant. But when he returns, 
it will be in majesty and everyone in the world will see him. We don't know how that will happen, but his return will be the most spectacular sight the world has ever witnessed. So that's the first thing. Jesus is coming back in glory. The second thing this line teaches us is when he does come, he's coming to judge the whole of the world. Acts 17, God has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. And he has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. A man who has experienced all the trials and temptations of life that you and I face, a man will judge the world. And uh, we're so glad about that. I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. And I saw the dead, great and small, important and unimportant, standing before the throne and books were opened. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The world will be judged according to their words and actions because God has put a conscience in every human mind which tells them what is right and what is wrong and they'll be judged according to that conscience. The world will be judged according to the light they were given. If uh, someone has been given more truth and more light they will be judged more severely if they were given less truth and less light, less severely. Jesus said it will be more bearable, he said this, to some of the towns. It will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for towns that saw his miracles and heard his precious words but rejected him. They had so much light The people of Sodom and Gomorrah had so little light by comparison. And then the Bible teaches that after this great day of judgment, the world will be separated into sheep and goats or wheat and tares. Here's Matthew 25. He will separate the the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And the king will say to those on his right, Come, you are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. And later Jesus says, And he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Jesus says that at the end of the day of judgment day, some will be welcomed into heaven and some will be condemned to hell. Now that's such a solemn, a solemn truth to hear, but, but it comes from the lips of Jesus himself. The third thing this little line is teaching us this, this morning is that Jesus is also coming back to judge believers. He's not only coming back to judge the world, He's coming back to judge believers. Paul says to his friends in Corinth, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due to him for the things done in the body, whether good or bad. 2 Corinthians 5.10. This judgment for believers uh, will be very different from the judgment for unbelievers because the end verdict of the judgment for believers will not be heaven or hell, but how great our eternal reward will be. Uh, God will ask us, how did you use and steward the gifts that I gave to you? How did you use your time, your money, your spiritual gifts, the opportunities he gave you? How did you, what kind of a steward were you with those things that he entrusted with us? He'll also ask us, how did you build your life? Did you build it on Christ? Did you build it on the Bible? Did you build it on Christ's words? Did you build your marriage, your family life, your career, your ministry on Christ? Or did you build it on the empty and passing philosophies and fads of the world? 
The fire of God's judgment, Paul says to Christians, will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. All believers will enjoy the gift of eternal life in heaven because Jesus has purchased that for us and he's preparing a place for us. But not all believers will be equally rewarded in heaven. And I know this is hard to understand, but just as there are levels of punishment in hell, as justice demands, so will there be levels or rewards in heaven. No one will be jealous of another that those feelings will be gone. But some who have laid up more treasures in heaven in this world will be given greater responsibilities than others in that glorious world to come. So this little line of the Apostles' Creed, he will come again to judge the living and the dead. It teaches us that Jesus is going to come back into the world in a glorious way one day. He's going to come back to judge the world and he's also going to come back to judge believers. Now let me spend a, a couple minutes just um, trying to, to understand why this is not so popular today. Why don't churches preach this truth? Why do they keep it under in, in, the, in the wardrobe? Um, there are many reasons. Here are a few. I think one of them is uh, science teaches a different end to the, the world and the universe and history. We live in a culture influenced by science and uh, science says the world universe began naturally in a big bang and then it will end in a heat death. Um, but the Bible says the world didn't begin naturally, it began supernaturally and the world will not end naturally, it will end supernaturally when Jesus returns in power and glory. Science does not know what is going to happen, even tomorrow, just like you and me, any more than we do. So um, it's a puzzle as to why Christians so often bow at its shrine. I think that's one reason Christians are reluctant to talk about Jesus coming in power and glory because they're, they, they've absorbed the, the worldview uh, from, uh, from some in the scientific community. I think a second reason people are, are, are reluctant to preach on the return of Jesus and the judgment is because of all the speculation um, the endless speculation about the date of his return, the signs of his return, and so on. I came across an American preacher who's, who's been teaching recently that coronavirus is for sure one of the great signs that proves the end is nigh, one of the plagues. And um, Christians become, can become so wearied by these waves of speculation, which turn out to be wrong so often and then they just disappear from public view that they they end up just not knowing what the future holds and not having that great expect expectation of Jesus returning. But I believe the main reason this line is so out of fashion today like that, some of the ties in my wardrobe, is because this world does not like the idea of God setting the judge, the standards and the commandments for what is right and what is wrong. So the idea of God judging me and deciding my behavior was wrong or right here is unacceptable. And I think you can see that perhaps most especially in the area of sexual ethics. Uh, as long as you do no harm is the mantra today, isn't it? Everything is okay. The Righteous Brothers and a host of songwriters since have echoed that philosophy. If it feels good, just do it. Here are some lyrics from their, one of their songs. Is it so wrong to love you this way when loving you feels so right? And according to the teaching of, of Christ, sex is to be preserved for marriage between one man and one woman alone. Marriage should be honored by all, 
and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral, Hebrews 13. Don't be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, or thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God, 1 Corinthians 6. God wants us to repent of all those sins. But our world totally rejects those unchanging standards of Christ. And so it's offended by the thought that Christ will one day judge us according to his commandments. He is the law maker and he is the judge. So those are some of the reasons um, why this, this, this line Jesus will come to judge the living and the dead is kept into the cupboard like some embarrassing tie. And it's a great pity because there are few truths more challenging or comforting than this one. So I just want to end this morning with three words of comfort and challenge. And here's the first one. Since Jesus will judge the world we can leave all vengeance and justice to him. When I read the autobiography of Albert Pierpoint uh, last year, he was England's uh, very last hangman. It seemed to me right throughout the book that his real reason for writing was to correct all the wrongs, the wrongs that the papers, the newspapers had written about him over the years. And many people do that. They, they, when they write their own stories, they, they, they feel the need for justice in, in this present world and to put wrongs right uh, before they die. But you know, being a believer changes your whole philosophy on that. Because if Jesus is going to one day judge the world, I don't have to worry about justice. Do not take revenge Romans 12, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. It is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord, Romans chapter 12. So how, how practical this is. Has someone harmed you? And you feel a great sense of injustice. And maybe you even, if you're honest with yourself, you want to take revenge. You needn't and you mustn't if you're a believer, because one day Jesus will judge the world in perfect justice. Paul said this, Alexander the metal worker did me a great deal of harm. Okay, Paul, what are you going to do about that? This is what he says. The Lord will repay him for what he has done. I'm not going to pay Alexander back. The Lord will pay him back. What a practical doctrine. Never ever take Revenge. So there's the first practical outcome of this, this doctrine. The second is this. Jesus is coming soon, so let us share the gospel with the world while there is still time. The return of Jesus should give a real urgency to evangelism. We need to share the gospel with our friends and the whole world while there's time because there is no opportunity to repent after Jesus returns. I remember at a, a, a pastor's conference many years ago hearing a Christian evangelist explaining how he, did, how he became an evangelist. And this is what had happened. His mother died very suddenly. And he had failed to pluck up the courage to share the gospel with her while she was alive. He'd never plucked up the courage. And so from then onwards, he was determined that he would never, ever allow that to happen again. And whenever, he, he vowed, whenever an opportunity came up, he would share the gospel because he didn't want that to happen again. He didn't want to think, oh, I, I could have, but I didn't. So I wonder if there's someone you need to share the gospel with before Jesus returns or before they pass into the night. Jesus is going to judge the world, so we can leave justice to him. Jesus is going to come back soon, so let's share the gospel with the whole world while there is time. 
And thirdly, the third practical truth is this. Jesus is coming back. So let us be ready for him. In the New Testament, this is the greatest way in which the truth of the second coming of Jesus ought to shape our lives. It ought to be a spur to holy living. Why? Because when Jesus returns, I do not want to be ashamed of what I'm thinking or saying or doing. And when Jesus returns to judge me, I don't want a long list of sins to be read out on the day of judgment. Time and time again, Jesus told his disciples, be ready, be ready with one story after another. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour, Matthew 25. You sometimes come across Christians who are careless about sin. They think sin doesn't matter. Jesus has paid for all my sins and I can go and behave as I please. No believer should ever think like that. Here's what John says. Everyone who has this hope of Jesus returning purifies himself just as Jesus is pure. Uh, this hope, if it's real, it's a purifying hope. It's a purifying hope. Jesus is coming back at any time. So you and I need to be ready and I need to stay ready. And I wonder whether this morning God is speaking to someone who is overlooking sin, who is careless about sin. And this morning Jesus is saying to you, you need to be ready and you need to repent by his grace today. A number of years ago, and I, I closed with this, I went, uh, um, I heard a sermon. I know it was in Michigan, in the States. I don't remember the preacher, and I, I'm, I'm ashamed to say, I only remember one sentence from the sermon. I'm sure the rest was good. But here's the sentence that I came away, away with. The arrow of eternity is set in time. The arrow of eternity is set in time. Where we spend forever and ever and ever, that enormous, that by far the biggest part of our existence is decided in the tiny short part of our earthly life. The arrow of eternity is set in time. So if we want to enjoy the eternal life that Jesus offers, and he does, we need to respond now. We need to respond right away. Because should he return tomorrow or next week, it'll be too late if we have not turned to him. We need to respond in this world to his command to repent and his gracious invitation to believe in him and follow him all our days. The final words of our closing song uh, remind us that when Jesus returns, every knee will bow in honor of heaven's King. Please sing with us if you can. Turn your eyes Just
Well, thank you everyone for joining us this morning. I hope you found our service helpful. I know we all miss actually meeting together in person, but this is still a good way, isn't it, in which we can worship, pray and learn together. And if you're new and you would like to be in contact with us, then please do use the contact details which are set out on our website. So I'm just going to close now in prayer. Let us pray. Dear Father, thank you for what you've taught us this morning about the glorious return of Jesus. Thank you indeed that every knee will bow and every tongue will shout, all glory to Jesus alone. Thank you for this great hope that unites all Christians in certainty of the future, that everything that is awful and wrong with this world will finally come to an end and that he will take his place with his people. And we commit this week to you, whatever we're doing, wherever we are, whoever we're with, we ask you to be with us in that situation. And now may the Lord of peace himself give us peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with all of you. Amen.